have a voice. I didn't lose it from the conference. Wow. True worship is the title of the message today. When the word worship comes to you, what comes to your mind? What is worship? Worship, what is worship, 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 worship? What is worship? Anyone? Shing. I know it's impromptu. Praise. Praising God. Yeah, that's right. Ate. I don't know. Three of you, your ates. Can you tell me what's worship? Praying. That's right. Oh, your dad must be proud. <laughs> praying. Yes, worship, praising, praying. That's part of worship. Worship. If you're going to look at the Old Testament, there's a Greek word there, proskoneo, meaning to bow down in reverence to God. And in New Testament, many translation of the worship from the Greek word latreia, meaning to worship God through service. There you go. So, Pastor Adam said, this is not the worship team. You are the worship team. And I would like to bring that to the next level. We are the worship team. We are the worship team. Not just by Sunday. We are the worship team. And I'm excited about that. I am part of worship team. Though I am not playing the instrument, though I'm not singing here in front, the Bible tells me that I worship God through my service. There's nothing wrong with prayer, bowing down, singing, dancing. That's part of our worship to God. What we did last week at the conference, that's way of worshiping God. But it doesn't stop there. And we will learn today what is true worship. All right? So let's, come on, let's dig in. Let's read from Romans 12, 1. Therefore, again, this word, therefore, Paul was so enamored by this word, therefore. He always used the word, therefore. He always would like to conclude something. He's trying to conclude preceding verses or chapters of Romans. But let's read first this verse 1 of Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is true and proper worship. There you go. That's the true and proper worship. It starts with in view of God's mercy. You have to view God's mercy, His goodness, His loving kindness, His faithfulness. That should motivate us to worship God. And what are those things? Therefore, you have to look at the preceding verses or preceding chapters. But actually, I'd like to educate you the way Paul writes his letters. The writings of Paul all the epistles always starts the first few chapters with doctrine, with the word, with the beliefs, doctrines, all right? And after that, after laying down the doctrines, he would tell you how to live that doctrine, how to live that belief. You get the idea? He would also, first he would establish, he would lay the foundation, this is the belief. And now that you know the doctrine, the belief, this is how you live. The first 11 chapters of Romans, they are doctrines, they are beliefs established by Paul. 
of who we are in Christ, who God is. And after laying that foundation, now he said, therefore, after saying all these things, therefore, brothers and sisters, he's talking to his fellow Christians in Rome in view of God's mercy. What, are the, what, are, what is this God's mercy? So I, I won't, we won't go there verse by verse or chapter by chapter. I sum it up here with God's mercies that you can find from chapter 1 to verse 11 that you are justified. I am justified. And this is the reason why I need to worship God. I used to be in sin, but justified meaning just as if you didn't sin. Meaning as if you are righteous. Not just as if you are righteous in Christ. Now you are justified. You are no longer considered as sinners because of Christ. And because of that, you, are, you have this motivation to worship God. Not only that, you, are, you used to be dead to sin because of your sins, of my sins. I am dead to sin, but because of Christ, I'm alive in Christ. And that is something that helps me to worship God. Adopted into God's family, we used to be orphans, we used to be lost, but we've, when we are in Christ, we are now part of His family. He is our brother. God is our father. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, in God's family. Also, before, we need to follow all the laws. We have to kill the sheep, the lamb, to offer all these things. But Jesus Christ already fulfilled that. And we're no longer under the law. But we are now under the power of grace of Jesus Christ. You don't have to do it by yourself. But you have to do it by Christ, your helper, your teacher, your guide, your advocate. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit now that you are in Christ. You could find that in first 11 chapters of Romans. And peace and reconciliation with God. We used to be in enmity with God. We used to be enemies of God. But now in Christ, we are now reconciled. We now have peace. You are no longer condemned. Yes, we, we, we keep on sinning now, but we are not living in sin, but we won't be condemned because Christ is already in us. There's no longer condemnation in Christ Jesus. And not only that, there's a promise of future glory. God is coming. Jesus Christ is coming to take his own. No separation from God. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons could be able to separate us from the love of God. Who could separate you from the love of God? Money, trouble, hardship. No, nothing could separate you from God. I am with you to the very end of the age, God said. No separation from God. Though you commit mistakes, though you lie, you deceive someone, but still, because you are in Christ, you can confess your sins, you are forgiven, nothing could separate you from God. You will be forgiven if you ask for forgiveness. And God is faithful. And that motivates me to worship my God. If your worship is precipitated by the songs, lights, drums, the beauty of the venue, if you're in Michael Fowler's in Wellington, if that's your motivation of worship, why if you no longer see a beautiful person in front or good voice or you no longer have a good lightings could you still worship God so that should that shouldn't be your motivation your motivation should be what God has done for you because that will never change these things that's you in Christ and that should motivate you to worship God what I experienced from God when I was young. Lord, thank you. I worship you. What we experienced last conference in Wellington, 
praise the Lord for that. We all arrived safely. So thankful to see all the leaders almost, all the leaders there in, in, in Wellington. So thankful, Lord, there's something worth praising you. We all arrived safe here. Some flew through, flew from, through planes, some uh, travel early, early morning, but, the, but safe travel was something to praise God. I'll give you a moment right now. Think of the reason why you should worship God, why we should worship God. Just the fact that you are here in New Zealand, it's something that you should give back to God and worship God's mercies. Therefore, worship God because of His mercy. Worship God because of His goodness. You will not run out of words when you look back and remember and remind yourselves of the goodness of God. Your children, your family, your job, your residency, your citizenship, your work permit, your church, your life groups. It's something that would help us to worship God. Next would be worship God with your body. Right? So worship is not just two fast songs and two slow songs. They say praise is two, slow, two fast songs and worship is two slow songs. That's why praise and worship. Oh, now it's time to praise. Oh, hallelujah. Time to, time to worship. What a beautiful name it is. Yes, that's worship. Don't get me wrong. That's part of worship. That's how we express worship. Kneeling is part of worship. Bowing down is part of worship. But with your body, it says here, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay, how to worship God according to this verse? Of course, yes. In view of God's mercy, that should be our motivation. But now, now, how we should worship God? By offering your bodies. Not just offering your bodies, but as a living sacrifice. Oh, this is scary. Because the concept or the idea of of sacrifice is killing. Offer our bodies. Offering our bodies means giving to God all of ourselves, not just a portion. The reference to our bodies here means all our human faculties, our mind, our emotion, our will, our hands. Our shoulders, our feet. Is that a song? My shoulder, my feet. We have to dedicate everything to God. We offer our hearts, our minds, everything. Offering our bodies means God wants you. Isn't that great? What's so special about me, Lord? Why do you want me to offer my life to you? I am a mess person. I'm a selfish person. I'm a sinner. I'm a prideful person. Why do you want me, Lord? Why am I so important to you? Why do you want me to offer my body as a living sacrifice? I am not an unblemished. I'm not a perfect sacrifice. Why do you want me? Why do you want me, Lord? You may do all the works in the church, but if you will never give yourself to God, that's not a worship. Yes, you can be a parking marshal, you can be a tactic at the same time, you can be playing worship, you can be a life group leader at the same time, 
But if you're not going to offer your whole self to God, it is not a worship. Because it says here, it should be a living sacrifice. In other words, we are to give up controls of these things in our lives and turn them over to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who is seated on the throne. Wow. This is not something that I thought of. I thought just serving the Lord at the kitchen and the camera or preaching would be enough as my worship to God. But I need to give all myself to Him. Just like a literal sacrifice in the Old Testament. When you sacrifice in the Old Testament, listen to this. You have to give the whole sheep, the whole lamb, the whole bull, the whole ram. You have to offer it at the altar where there is a fire. Meaning all of it must be consumed. Not just a portion. The difference of Old Testament and the New Testament sacrifice is huge. In the Old Testament sacrifice, the, the, the sheep, the animal should be slaughtered and killed. But in the Old Testament, it's not about killing the sacrifice. It's not about slaughtering the sacrifice. It must be offered as a living sacrifice. Because the death of the animal, the death that would satisfy the anger of God to the sin is already fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ already died for us. Instead of us who would die for the punishment of our sins, Jesus Christ did that for us. And now, what we need is to be a living sacrifice. Why? In order for us to glorify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In the Old Testament, they need to slaughter, they need to kill the sacrifice to satisfy God's righteousness and holiness. And now here, in the New Testament, as Christians, we are living sacrifice not to be killed, not to be slaughtered, but for us to give glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords by offering our bodies. How's your body? Are you offering? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. How do you manage your body if that's the temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you offer your right hand and not the left, uh, left, the left uh, leg and not the uh, right leg and the left leg? You have to offer both. Oh, I'll give my right hand to God and not my left hand. I think that's enough. No, come on. Are you living in, in heaven and where your left leg is on hell? If you're in your workplaces or your schools, how do you engage with people? How do you operate? Is your one foot on hell or another foot on in heaven? But both, all of it. If God would visit my home, I would let him manage the whole area. Not, Lord, don't touch my bedroom, please. Don't touch my office. Don't touch my kitchen. Touch everything. Just don't touch my kitchen. That's not the way God operates. God wants the whole you. Because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are bought at a price. What price? The blood of Jesus. Therefore, you have to worship God with your body. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. And God will use that living sacrifice for all eternity. Not just during Sunday, my friend. Not just during worship service. Not just during life group. God will use that body for whole eternity. That's why worship is not just during Sundays. Worship is a... Whoa. Wow. Wow. 
Shum. Worship is a lifestyle. Right? If you are going to offer your body as a living sacrifice, therefore it will be used for all eternity. Should be, it should be continuous. So it says there, Therefore I urge brothers and sisters in view of God's mercies to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. If it is a living sacrifice, meaning it is continuous, then it must be alive with holiness. And it must be pleasing to God. It is actually continuous. Not just during Sundays. When, when we sing songs of worship on Sundays, it feels good, right? But how about singing songs of worship on Monday? How does it feel? It must be good. There should be consistency. How about during camps? When we are at family camp, oh, oh, praise God. Actually, I miss worshiping here through songs because in the, in the conference, I cannot jam. It's too crowded. I'm so free. I turned the stage, yeah, yeah, that's another thing. Awesome. You missed that. I went on stage and I danced for the love of LEC. <laughs> right. So at a conference as well, it's so good to dance, it's so good to worship God. I hope that and I pray that it's also good and, and, and it feels good as well to worship God in this church. Also in your personal devotion or personal time with God. But how? How can I make it as a lifestyle? How can I make my life holy and pleasing to God if I'm going to live a life of worship? How can I do that, Pastor June? It's hard in this day and age. How can I do that? It's clear. The passage tells us that renew your mind. This is your true worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, it starts here. What you feed, what you feed your brain would come out with your action. There is a quotation that I would like to quote that says, So a thought, you would reap action. So an action, you would reap a habit. So a habit, you would reap what? Character. So a character, you would reap destiny. So you should start with the right thinking so that you would have a right action. When you have a right action, continuous action, you would have a right habit. And if you have a right habit, you would have a right character. If you have a right character, you would have a good and great destiny. So you have to transform your mind. How can I transform my mind in order for me to live a life of worship with holy and pleasing to God? The word of God is essential to our transformations of mind. Yes. If you will not, if you will not feed your mind with the word of God, what could transform your mind? If you continue to feed your, 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 your mind with juice feed, with your FB feed or what have you, and that would be ingrained in your mind and it would result in your action. You cannot control your action if you let control your mind. It starts with the mind. Therefore, start reading the Word of God, feed on the Word of God in order for you to have a right action. Your habit, that's the direct result of your Continuous action. Your actions tells me what would be your habit next week or next month. Therefore, you have to transform by the renewing of your mind. It is my prayer that each and every one of us, it would be our lifestyle of holy and 
our lifestyle of life is holy and pleasing through the renewing of our mind. Because the truth of the matter is, we people, we are intrinsically deceptive, liar, selfish, prideful. If we won't renew our mind through the word of God, then the word will feed our lust our fear, our doubts, our pride. Therefore, we have to be transformed in order for us to live the kind of life that God wants us to live. Many of us have been renewed last week through the word. Many of us have been renewed through conference this week, right? But remember, our worship last week from, the, from, from this church and also from the conference won't stop there. It should transform us. It's a lifestyle. That's why it's, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's your worship. Because how you engage to your husband, to your wife, and that reflects how you, may, how you engage with God and how, what's in your heart. If the way you engage your husband, your wife is questionable, then your relationship with God is also questionable. The way you manage your household, the way you interact with your kids reflects your, your, your relationship with God. It reflects your lifestyle. Therefore, husband, wife, love one another. Submit to one another. Children, obey your parents. Parents, teach your children. That's a lifestyle. That's your worship to God. When you love your wife, that's your worship to God. When you love your husband, when you honor your, your parents, that's your worship to God. When you honor your boss, when you submit to the authority, that's your worship to God. That's a lifestyle. You cannot have it overnight. You need to have a renewed mind, and then you have an action, and then that would proceed to your habits, and that would precipitate to character, and then great destiny. And it is a lifestyle. It is not a one-off Thing. It's not because you attended the camp, the conference, or the church service. Oh, I'm fine. I am worship. I worship God. I think I am blessed. I heard the word of God. I'm fine. How about you next Sunday? How about you on Monday, on Tuesday, or Wednesday, or Thursday? How's your lifestyle? All right. So, church, sorry, this is not a conference. This is church. You need to hear this. You can't hear this. You can hear these things on the conference only in your Local church. So, thirdly, worship God with your spiritual gift. If you would read the first few verses of Romans 12, it pertains to worship through service. Latreia, not proskuneo. Proskuneo in the Old Testament meaning to bow down in worship. There's nothing wrong with that. But here, Paul said in verse 1, it is latreia meaning to Serve, worship God through service. That's why he included some spiritual gift here. In order for you to worship me through service, I'm giving you some gifts here. It tells us here that for just as each of us, each of us, each of us Christians has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function. Meaning one body of course, not the same function. So in Christ, though many from one body and each member belongs to all the others. I belong to you, my sister. You belong to me. You belong to that brother and that brother belongs to you as well. And this tells me that we have something in common. The vision of Christ, the mission of Christ here on earth is to edify the body of Christ that he may be able 
to reflect the image of God and that they would be saved and many people from the earth will be blessed through him. It tells us here that we have different gifts. Your gifts may be different from my gifts. It tells us according to the grace given to each of us, God has bestowed grace upon all of us, upon each of, each of us. According to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If your gift is, then if it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is lead, is to lead, do it di diligently. And if it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And it just tells us here that we have to use the gift. Because it, this verse tells us that each of us, we have spiritual gifts. Yes, you are. If you are indwelt by the Spirit, if you are a born-again Christian, you have the Spirit in you. Therefore, you have a spiritual gift. And that's your worship to God when you use that spiritual gift to edify the body of Christ. It wasn't given to you just for your own, just for your own consumption, but for the consumption of the body of Christ. Therefore, you have can worship God with your spiritual gift. You have to discover that, Lord, what's my spiritual gift? Most likely, your spiritual gift is where you are good at, where you are gifted at, and what you are passionate. You are passionate with these things, and then you have to worship God. And when you worship God through your spiritual gift, you have to do something about that spiritual gift, my friend. You have to polish that spiritual gift. You have to use it. You have to make it more, you have to use it for, for the glory of God and for the good of people. If it's preaching and teaching, then study. If it is a life group leader, you have to love, be compassionate to people. If it is prophesying, then start prophesying. You have to exercise that gift. Improve your giftings. Oh, you cannot improve it. In, in, in improve your talent. While using it, you are polishing it, and you are making it more stronger and powerful through the Holy Spirit. If you say you are called to do this and you're not doing it, you are not exercising, you have to question God, Lord, why? And you're not worshiping God. If you are not using or exercising your spiritual gift, yes, you have to be settled with that, that you are gifted. You are gifted by the Holy Spirit in you. You have to use it, exercise it. And finally, worship God with your service. With love. Because this tells me from the love must be sincere, meaning you are serving the body of Christ. Then this service must be motivated by love. Love must be sincere. When you love someone, you are worshiping God. When you're loving the person next to you, the difficult person in your church, in your life group, in your workplace, or in your schools, when you're loving that person, then you are worshiping God with that because you are reflecting the image of God who is love. Hate what is evil. If you are conforming to the pattern of this world and you don't hate evil, you even give permission to evil, then you are not worshiping God. Then you have to hate evil. Cling to what is good. This is good. I want to propagate this good. I want to champion these good things. Then you are worshiping God. What are the good things happening in your church, in your life group, in your workplaces, in your, in your, in your home? You have to champion that good things. Dad, mom, or my son, my daughter, this is what we need to do. This is a good thing. We have to cling to this good. Then you are worshiping God. Be devoted to one another in love. When serving one another, when you're serving at the host, host table, when you're, host, when you're serving at the car park, you have to love one another in love. Love the parking marshal in return. Parking marshal, love the people who's coming here. In the same manner, each and every one of us, we have to love one another. And that's how we worship God. Never honor one another above yourselves. Do not be 
do not look at yourself as more powerful, more stronger than anybody, but, but give people the honor and do not treat them as your slave, nothing, but you have to honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. You have to be zealous. When you come to church, you have to be passionate and zealous. Come on. It's okay. I understand sometimes we are pro problematic. No? But the joy of the Lord is our strength. Remember, there are some people coming here ready to, ready to take their lives, ready to kill themselves. If they see you, oh, oh, oh I'm going to kill myself. If you're there, yes, you have problems, you have issues in life, you have trouble at home. And when you come here, Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Someone here needs my, my, my smile. Someone here, Lord, needs my hands to, to, at, a, pat, at a, a tap in the back. Come on, that's your worship to God. You have to be zealous about what you're doing. You have to be zealous in your, in your ministry. You have to be zealous in your life group, in your prayer. You have to be zealous in those things. But keep your spiritual fervor, fervor the same way. The same thing, that's synonymous. Zeal and spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Wow, what's your ministry? What's your work in the Lord? You have to be zealous with that. Be joyful in hope and patient in affliction. Yes, this is Three things that I need you to really understand here. In service, you should be joyful. Why? Because there is hope. Be joyful because you are serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In worship, be joyful. Joy, joy in worship is not just dancing, jumping, and just Raising hands and shouting. Be joyful in hope because you have hope in Christ. Therefore, you have this hope. That's where you can serve people. You can serve God with a joyful sound. Patient in affliction. You're afflicted. You are problematic. You are, you are having pain right now. Be patient while you're serving. There's something, something good is going to happen. And faithful in prayer. We are faithful here. Faithful in giving. Faithful in prayer. Faithful in serving. Faithful in waiting. Faithful. Faithful to one another. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. This is service. Service in the body of Christ. We can worship God by doing all these things. You may serve God with your actions, with all the works here, but if you don't have love, if you don't cling to what is good, but if you, you don't love one another, if you don't honor others above yourselves, if you don't have zeal or fervor, if you don't have joy, patience, or faithfulness, then we are missing the point. We are not worshiping God. So now that I have laid down all these things, that worship is not just two fast songs during Sundays, it is something that we really work on by offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is a lifestyle, my friend. When you go out of this room, you are worshiping God. We are worship team, not just them, not just you, all of us. We are worship team, not just during Sundays, but we are worship team out there. We are declaring the beauty of God that many people will see who God is through us. Worship God with your body. What part of your body that you need to offer to God right now? You don't think your wallet is part of your body? Maybe. Your lifestyle. How do you project in your school, in your workplaces, your spiritual gifts, how do you use that? How do you manage it? How about your service to it? Are you zealous? Are you fervor? Do you, do you do it with love or you do it with compulsion? Let's all stand, church. Praise God. Translate this worship through worship to God by loving people outside this room, 
by reaching out to your workplace, to your neighbors, to the community, to the missions. That's worship. We are missing the point if we would just keep this worship in this room. Worship is a lifestyle. The point of worship is God. And when we do all these things, it all points to God. Thank you, Jesus. And if you want to worship God, you should, you should have a personal relationship with Him. And if you're here today, if you really you want like to experience the true worship, a living sacrifice being offered to God, that is your life. offer your body as a living sacrifice to God and receive Him as your personal Lord and Savior and any parts of your part of your body or your life that hasn't been submitted to Him or committed to Him or offered to Him, this is your chance. If it is your pride, if it is your anger, your bitterness, your finances, your selfishness, your relationship, sacrifice to you. Please forgive me. I receive you. I accept you into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior from now on. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are now indwelt by the Spirit. God will not disappoint you send His Spirit on your life to help you, to empower you, to increase you, to help you to do His will, and to live the kind of life that He wants you to live. Yes, you are now born again. You are now a new person in Christ. The old is gone, and the new has come. And you are now a living sacrifice. You can worship God wherever you go, in your workplace, in your schools, in your community, at home, in the church, wherever you are, wherever you go. Thank you, Jesus.